future historians, when they look back and try to chronicle all of the myriad events that have happened in the last old quarter century or so, in an attempt to isolate the single moment that touched everything off, will more than likely have varying opinions about when it started, but they will have virtual unanimity about when it passed the point of no return, and that was today. This issue with Mr. Trump now being a convicted felon 34 times is going to send reverberations throughout politics and around the world, more than likely for the rest of our lifetimes. You see, the guys who fought at Lexington and Concord knew it was a momentous occasion that something had started. Now, if you had told them what was going to transpire over the next three to five, ten years, they would have probably been shocked. But the vast majority of the country they fought for has now been lost. And I think that would have been the greatest shock to them all. That after having suffered so much and sacrificed so much for freedom and liberty, to have taken it away from ourselves at this point will seem something beyond anything they could comprehend. Now, in today's video, I'm going to share some advice about standing up a resistance and an insurgency. It was something that military intelligence focused on a great deal. It's kind of one of the dirty little secrets about military intelligence is that you focus much more on domestic issues and keeping an eye on your friends than you really do your enemies. Over at Patreon, I'm working on a gloves-off version of this video that will really get into the meat of what you really need to do. And it'll be controversial because it's not going to be anything you've heard here on YouTube. Because the stuff on YouTube sounds good and looks good in the movies. It really does. But in reality, if you want to understand how to run a successful resistance campaign, insurgency campaign, study World War II and the French and Spanish Maquis. Now, if you'd like to join us over at the Florida Maquis Patreon channel, it's one US dollar per month, even less if you sign up for an entire year, fully refundable, first 90 days, no questions asked. Once again, taking the gloves off. Love to have you over there. Without any further delay, two minutes, 50 seconds, let's get into the meat of today's video. Now, I'd like to start here. I know there's a lot of people in my audience who are former military, and I'd like to ask you guys a question. Do you think in this picture that this particular drill instructor is complimenting the recruit on how good a job he's done on his teeth, saying, wow, we normally have to uh, train all of our new recruits to really get into those gaps and shine up. But boy, you're really good at that. You're really good. What else are you really good at, recruit? We want to know. We want to know all the things that you knew to prepare for so that we can focus and accentuate our training. No, absolutely not. What are they going to do in training? They're going to find what you're worst at. And they'll get it out of you. I don't care if you ran five miles a day for the previous six months. I don't care if you did 200 push-ups a day for the previous six months as well. They will find a way to break you in recruit training. You think these two uh, drill instructors here are drill sergeants, I guess this is Army, um, asking this guy about why he did so well on his ASVAB score? Saying, man, we... Boy, boy, you know, Private, we need you to help other soldiers bring up their scores too. You did that really well. You really did. See, this isn't an encouraging moment. This is a breaking moment. They're going to find what you do poorly, and they're going to bring that up, and they're going to focus on that. And there's a lot of things, no matter what branch you're in, that you're just not prepared for. And training for the unprepared is what makes a good unit. It's what makes a good military training for the things you don't think you're going to have to face. Now, 
if you'd like a little bit of entertainment on this, this kind of goes back a little bit. He hasn't put up any real videos for a long time. <coughs> uh, Yesha Thomas, uh, drill sergeant from the golden era back in the 90s. Um, they would find, unlike today, back then, literally anything, anything at all, whether it was important or not, to mess with you. In this particular case, it's somebody sneezing in formation. In another case, it's uh, somebody having uh, boot laces right over left and a left over right or vice versa, one of the two. What does this have to do with training? What does this have to do with militia? Well, who remembers? Who remembers when the pre the person to me, um, the leader of the new Free Republic of Florida, stood up with his son in hand and announced the reformation of the Florida State Guard. Now, there's a detail about the Florida State Guard that I think would blow a lot of folks' minds. How many of you knew that if you are a member of the Florida State Guard, you are immune from being drafted into the U.S. military? You cannot be brought into the U.S. military under any circumstances if you are a member of the Florida State Guard. Look it up. Go to the Florida State Guard website. By law, you are protected from being drafted. Currently, 23 states. And the territory of Puerto Rico actively maintains state guards. State guards are authorized under Title 32 of U.S. Code and operate distinctly from the National Guard. They are state-funded, responsive to the governor, and focused on the needs of their home state. The 23 states that currently maintain a state guard, Alaska, California, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, New, New Mexico, New York, Ohio, Oregon, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, Virginia, and Washington. Now, under Florida statute 251, signed in 2023, the Florida state guard shall be used exclusively within the state or to provide support to other states. For the purpose stated in this section and may not be called, ordered, or drafted into the armed forces of the United States. Now, the number is limited to 1,500 and we've had orders of magnitude more sign up. So they're probably going to lift that number. Now, what makes a good state guard? Well, you can kind of see it a little bit in this picture. You see some guys that are out of shape. You see some guys that are older, some guys that are younger. You got some things. There's training that needs to be done. These guys probably did what they could to get ready. But the training takes place here, not ahead of time. You see, I was a football player. I had played football, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. I ran track. I was in wrestling. When I showed up for the military, I was in pretty good shape, physically speaking. And it still kicked my ass, like so many others. Because you have to operate as a unit with a whole bunch of other people you never met before to be effective. And sometimes things get a little chewed up, a little messed up. But you work together and teamwork Teamwork is always the key. It's always to be preferred over individual effort. Let me say that again. If you're going to stand up a resistance, if you're going to stand up an insurgency, if you're going to operate as a unit and you're going to be effective, it is always preferred that you operate as a group, not an individual. Now, this having been said, there's also the Florida militia. It's a very different thing than the Florida State Guard. We'll talk about that in another video. However, yesterday we talked about this thing, this tactical games thing. Now, let me be very clear. Nine minutes and 35 seconds for those of you who want to refer to me saying this. I am all about training with a ballistic weapon. I am all about having knowledge. I am all about being in shape and exercising. Those things are great. I think those things are far more important, especially the training and exercising aspect, than many other things you see lots of videos on. 
I think it's more important than stockpiling things, to be honest. If you have a 275-pound soldier and a 175-pound soldier, a 175-pound soldier is going to go through a lot fewer supplies than a 275-pound soldier. Why? Because, generally speaking, you need 10 calories per pound of body weight to maintain yourself. Meaning that if you have a 160, 170, 180 pound soldier, they're going to roughly need, just ballparking, 16, 17, 1800 calories worth of food a day to maintain weight. Somebody who's 275, nope, 2700, 2800 calories a day. So for an extra 1000 calories a day, you can add people to your unit by getting rid of the biggies. Now, this issue with tactical games, I'm sure a lot of people are looking at this going, haven't you seen these guys, Mucky? These guys are ripped. These guys are shredded. These guys are at the top of their games. Like, yeah. See, what they're going out and doing is just repeating things they already know how to do. You see, what they've the, the reason they call it games and not training, it's not tactical training, is that they go into gyms and they're CrossFitters. And they do all of these different lifts and these different things. And then they design games around the things they're already good at. They design games around things they're already good at. That is not training. That's why I started here. When you join the military and you get trained and you get brought up in their way of doing things, whether it's Marines or Army or whoever, Navy... They're going to break you down and rebuild you in a unit that does things all the same way. And most of the things you're going to learn to do are not going to be solo events. You're going to have to learn to do them as a team. Now, when I look at all these people, and God bless them for having done it on their own. I'm not saying this is a negative for their personal life. They're ripped to shreds. They've got state-of-the-art weapons that they've been practicing with. But I'll I'll warn you know, I'm just gonna say it. There's nobody there was nobody in the military when I was in that looked like this. I know this is a great exercise, a great exercise for toning up your shoulders, slamming a sledgehammer into the side of a giant tire. But it has no practical application. I saw this, and honest to God, I just was like, what are they doing? What are they doing? If you're in the military, and military guys, back me up. Back me up on this. If you had two giant metal pipes that had a bunch of weight on them, and they had four handles, and you were the individual that went over there, and decided, you know what, I'm going to grab this all up by myself and do this by myself and run it down. Or if you decided that this was how you were going to carry this amount of weight down range, everybody in the military would look at you like you're crazy. Now, I know for workout purposes, for getting a workout, if you want to do this, okay, I suppose, but it doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense for a tactical group, case in point, Special Forces, Panama, Operation Just Cause, I promise you, I promise you, none of the 11 guys, we'll see, 2, 4, 6, 10, 11 guys in this picture saw the inside of a gym within the first probably Well, I'll say, you know what, I'll go ahead and say it. Probably not in their entire military career did they see the inside of a gym at this time in the 70s and 80s, and even into the 90s, really. If you you had a workout that needed to be done, it was done on a PT field. Push-ups and sit-ups and flutter kicks and running. And these guys seemed to get the job done. They didn't need all that kind of stuff. Now, when you look at this group from a little bit later, of these, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 guys, I'll bet you maybe three 
three might part-time spend some time in the gym. Three out of these guys. Because you can just tell by look at them, this is all muscle that you would get from just work and not overeating and just being a soldier and trying to adapt to things that are uh, just kind of outside your wheelhouse. I promise you none of these guys went to the gym, that's for sure. And like I said, I'm not against going to the gym, but if shit got real and I needed a group of guys that could move and work and get things done and work as a team and work as a unit, sometimes silently, you give me a Venezuelan work crew. You give me a Venezuelan work crew and I'll take it over any CrossFit gym guys all day. I mean, these guys can pick up big, heavy shit and move it around all day long. You know why? Because that's what they do. These masonry crews and construction crews, you know who else is really good at this? These guys. These guys are strong as oxes and can fight. And they work together all the time as team. And they never pick up a weight. And boy, I tell you, in a shit hits the fan situation, in a shit hits the fan, grid down, power down, end of the world situation, if you could hook up with some way, some a group that are either Mennonite or Amish, I'll tell you what, you're going to be in really, really good shape. Because they, you know, they say, look, we got to go damn, we got to go damn stream to divert water. You know, and all we got are shovels and buckets those guys are going to be able to very much more than likely be able to do bucket brigade and move 15 20 maybe 30 ton of rock to divert stream to do whatever they need to do you see you can and look if you want to work out to be healthy and to look good and to feel healthy all that kind of stuff i'm all for it there's nothing wrong with it all working out beats sitting on your ass. I see guys at the range all the time that are 280, 340, 400 pounds. And these guys have absolutely their priorities backwards. They're driving around in $60,000, $70,000 trucks. They're driving around a $70,000 truck. They weigh almost 400 pounds. They got nine weapons. But but they couldn't, I don't think they could walk one lap around a regulation track without having a heart attack. And they call themselves militia. They, they call themselves the guys that are going to be the ones that are standing up and dealing with this. I mean, CrossFit's fantastic. But as we talked about yesterday, going all over the country to just outside of military bases... And giving away all of your gear, giving away all of your, your tactics and techniques and everything you know and who you are. And there was one picture here I wanted to share. Hold on. See this right here? Do you know why the military banned visible tattoos? Because it's like putting your fingerprints out there. See this picture right here will pertain to one individual in the universe. See all these tattoos? You could have a scope with a camera on it from a mile away if you're the enemy. Take this picture, and we will designate him, if we don't know his name, we will designate him Operator Alpha, and we'll keep him in a file. And we will know that this is Operator Alpha by this very unique signature on his right elbow of all these different tattoos. And you have now identified yourself. You are no longer anonymous. It's one of the reasons, um, and it just ran into my mind, that they banned visible tattoos in the military for a very, very long time. It was also the reason, and this is probably a little bit more salacious, but we're at 20 minutes. Um, who remembers back during World War II, um, the Germans were trying to uh, select out different uh, ethnicities as prisoners in the war. 
And there was a very, very certain specific way you could tell Jewish Americans from other Americans. And so what did we do to stop that? That one specific thing that was done to Jewish boys when they're born now was done to all men when they were born and all that were in the military at the time so that if they were captured, nobody could discern one ethnicity from another. And I'll let you figure that out, put that all together. There's from a very simple way, at least at that time in World War II, to tell someone who was Jewish from someone who's not, at least if you were a male. That's why they did this. They weren't trying to say, oh, you know, we don't want you to have t tattoos because we want to control who you are. They just didn't want you to be easily identifiable. This would be the worst thing. If you were trying to be an insurgent, if you were trying to stand up some kind of resistance, the last thing you want is a bunch of tattooed guys because they're so easily identified. Because what do we know about tattoos? They're all unique. They're what make me me. That whole bullshit line of thinking that is completely antithetical to anything that's in the military. So I will leave that there. But God bless y'all. Thank you so much for your support. I very much appreciate it. Hope this video was helpful. If you'd like to support, which you could sure use it, only $1. It's only a dollar, not per video, not per week, per month. $1 per month. Even less if you sign up for an entire year, fully refundable. Fully refundable. No matter how many videos you've watched over there. First 90 days, no questions asked. God bless you guys. Pray for me. I'll pray for you. Pray for each other. Lift each other up. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you guys next time.